it's good to be back in the workshop after spending the last couple of weeks at my parents' place doing that veranda reno. Gave me a chance to clean up things a little bit and make some plans for the future. But my most immediate challenge now is, how do I recycle this? These are some of the old slats and posts which I managed to save from the demolition job. They had a lot of rot in them, but on site I've just trimmed them all down. Obviously they're too short to be used as slats, but some of these by the weight are genuine hardwood. I think I've got some Merbo, I've got some Maranti, I do think I've got some iron bark or spotted gum. These posts weigh a ton, and while they are in rough shape, if you clean them up, they come out looking like this, and I am positive I can find something to do with this quality lumber. I normally don't have access to hardwood, so that's great. However, in order to get the paint off these and get them to a usable state, I decided to pull out my planer. Now, I got this for free with my brushless kit from Makita. Uh, not a brushless model, but still, I never found a need to use it. Now I do. So the challenge today is to turn this, as I'm fond of doing, into this. By inverting a planer, I'm effectively making a 3 inch, 7.5 centimetre jointer. Let's see if we can turn this into a more useful tool by inverting. So I've decided the height is going to be 18 centimetres, 180 millimetres high. So the first thing we'll do is rip some 17 mil ply down to that height. Just because I love a bit of woodworking irony, this is some great free wood that I scabbed again on Facebook Marketplace, and I got a whole ton of it. But I'm not entirely sure this edge is perfectly flat. I don't think it's a factory edge. So I'm actually going to have to use my planer as a planer to quickly run over this and shore it up so that the rip cut has a reference edge to go off. And the length of my side pieces is going to be 400 mil. Now then, the tricky bit. Obviously I have two very different holes that I need to cut in order to get the plane to sit on the side pieces. So we're going to start on this side, which will be the outside, a bit pointed away from me, this is where the chips are going to shoot out, and we'll cut that one like that, we'll repeat for the other, and it's just going to be a real fiddly balancing act, uh, going to cut it out with a jigsaw first and then with a the router to clean it up until we get it nice and balanced and we can put some supports in. Okay, that's one side cut. That did take a lot of fussing around. But that is how the outfeed side is going to sit. So my chips will spit out here. I'll repeat the process for the other side and then we'll figure out some braces between there. Right, second side's cut. And that is square that way. And that way. Now obviously that's counting on this being level, which it probably isn't terribly. The more important thing is that when I get the fence on, it's at right angles. This 40 centimetre long bit will be for the floor. The floor needs to be 7.5 centimetres wide, same as the planer.
Right, now I'm just going to screw it together for now to make sure everything can be pulled apart again in case I bug it up something along the way. And I still need to cut a few extra holes. I quickly cut up two little braces which are going to fit here and here on the top. Again, just going to screw them for the moment. They're also going to act as handles, so I'll have something to grab to kick the jointer up that way. Nice. Main part of the box done. Now I've got to stack up some access. Beginning with where I want my fence rod to be able to go. I'll trim that out. So earlier you saw I was using my expensive CMT bit from Carbotech, and this is one of the cheap ultra bits from Bunnings. Just a slight difference in the uh, sharpness and the quality of the cut. I am replacing these slowly over time. They were very cheap, and the Acarpatec ones are very expensive, but there's just simply no comparison between the quality of cut you get. Look at that burn. That's some plywood. So what that's for, we pop the planer back in, is this. Oh no, I'm not deep enough. Will be for that, which I'm going to mount my fence to at this end. I haven't figured out how I'm going to stabilize at this end yet. Probably just a wedge. But that needs to also go down a little bit further. So I've cut the backing board for my fence off another one of the offcuts at 60 centimeters long. However, that's not a very good fence for anything. This I also managed to pick up at that free scab of plywood. And it's some um, steel solid copper mill sick and that will make a very good flat fence. So I've marked that at 62, and I'm gonna try and cut it with the angle grinder as straight as I can. So that worked quite well. I've used a file just to take off all the sharp edges on the metal, I'll attack it a bit more later. For the moment, I want it to sit on there. If you're wondering how I got it ripped down to this length, it came this way. I was just very, very lucky. What I'm going to use is some polyurethane glue. This should stick anything to anything. This is really a test more than anything. If it buggers up and doesn't work, I don't really care. But I have hopes that it will. Now that polyurethane glue expands like no tomorrow, so you don't need a huge amount of it. But we'll clamp this up overnight. We'll come back tomorrow and keep going. Right, I've actually just had a week off in China visiting my parents-in-law. And while I didn't have any time to do woolwork over there, I did get some sketch-up done for some future projects. Now I've got to remember where the hell I was at with this bloody jointer. Got my fence, that's all glued up, I think I might have mentioned that. And I might have mentioned how I'm planning on mounting it using this guide bracket. Now the reason I'm using it is because it should be perfectly square to the plane. Right, that's my fence screwed on, but I'm going to take it away for the moment. Because what I want to do is to put a bit of a feed on each side in order to give me some more working area, just to help stabilise the bits that I'm running through. And I'm going to use this. Now this is the counterpart to my router table fence. And I was keeping it as a spare, but 
quite frankly, I don't see that one wearing out anytime soon. And if it does, I'll probably improve the design. So this is going to sit here effectively, which means I need to trace out and cut away that much. And it'll give me a nice solid bank for which to run my bits along on either side of the jointer. Right, to clean this up, I'm going to use my router table fence, which is, uh, funnily enough, looks a bit familiar there, doesn't it? Well, I obviously wanted to keep this as one piece because it would look neater, but I completely forgot about this bit jutting out there, which is obviously going to be impossible. It's the same height, so I can't rebate it in. That's all right, I'll just chop this into two bits and we'll measure it out to there and there instead. Right, it's all coming together quite nicely. I've decided I'm only going to glue on the wings. I don't want to have the screw holes in the front. And I've also made sure I set this to my preferred cutting depth, which is only half a mil. I've set it to its lightest pass. It's gonna be tricky for me to adjust the depth of the shoe in this thing. So I'm just gonna keep it for the moment at that half mil. What that means, however, is I do need to clear away a tiny bit of the fence here and to here to make sure that when that blade comes around, it doesn't touch in it and destroy my cutting surface. overnight a couple of days actually let's make sure it's stuck down oh good this is just an angle bracket that I had left over from the veranda project and I'm going to use it as the back support for the fence now I'm attaching it to the jointer itself because I want that fence to be able to be removed easily so it's not going to be screwed down onto the actual fence very careful with MDF you need to drill pilot holes and I need to make sure I don't blow through the bottom Right, now if you had a normal corded planer, you'd be basically done here. But I've got the additional problem with my cordless battery powered planer that I need to figure out a way to safely activate the switch. So what I'm gonna do is cut out a bit here to access the controls and then make something up. So while fiddling with the way to put a switch on here, I actually lost one of my wings. It wasn't so much a glue fail as a chipboard fail. This MDF is recycled off a kitchen bench and it's just a bit flaky. You can see it's literally just pulled the bottom layer of MDF off. So I've marked out where it goes and I'm gonna have to countersink and drill some holes in here to attach it with screws. No big loss, just not aesthetically pleasing. Now I just gotta extend my pilot holes through into the wood. Right, well I took a risk and I worked out that this bit here was not actually adding any support to the planer and by cutting it away, I've made a really big and safe cavity in which to access the controls. This has all been glued and screwed on. I haven't screwed this on. If it ever falls off, I can always repeat the process, but for the moment it seems to be holding. Two steps to turning this on. You've got the safety click, and then of course you've got the trigger as well. So fortunately, I had one of these lying around. It's just a really simple little metal band that has a tightening adjustment on there. And if I get my hands clearly out of the way, because the battery is on this. So the way this is going to work is that I'll be able to manually lift up the safety trigger, and that actually has a habit of staying in place once you've pulled it down. <laughs> and then I have this on here. It'll make more sense when we put it in the machine. Let's see how it works. Okay, so that's how she's gonna rest, like so. All right, so here's my trigger. I need to depress this to get it in, and then I can push down. And by lifting it up, I stop again, so. 
I reckon that's pretty safe for a battery powered planer. I can do it quickly and safely. If you don't have one of these little bits lying around, I'm sure that if you're clever enough to build this, you're clever enough to jerry-rig your own solution. As I said, corded would be better, but I don't have one and I'm not buying one for this. Right, so I think we're just about done. Let's put it all together, give it a test and see what we have come up with. So make sure you've got the safety on to lock before you start handling any of these pieces. Fence slides in like so. We can tighten it up after it's installed. Sit in like that. Slide her into place. So my little knobs are giving me trouble here. If I tighten it in a bit. There we go. Right, so plane is in place. Position the fence up against the support. Reach in here and tighten that. Sorted. And we're set up. Only takes a few seconds to get that in and out again. Now I have still got this set at zero clearance, so I can't actually run anything. I can reach the adjustment knob, which is inside here, but of course I'm not going to be able to see any reading. So probably best that when you are going to use this to set the depth before you install it. I've set this up to be almost exclusively cutting at half a mil because that's only what I'm ever going to want to take off. I'm mostly going to use this for jointing small boards, of course, being a three inch planer, it can't do much more than that. There is a little bit of play in here. It's obviously not ideal. As long as these two bits are lined up flush, then that's what I'm mostly concerned with. And importantly, I've already checked this, but the fence is sitting at a true 90, and that's the really important thing for the jointer. Awesome, all right, let's set a depth of 0.5 mil and see how we go. Now, obviously one of the problems with this design is this recycled MDF uh, countertop that I've used wasn't fantastic for gluing, and I actually lost the other side, and I've had to repeat my glue and screw process here to put the front wing on. And honestly, the reason that came off is because one of the things with this design that's a little bit frustrating is it is tricky to get this in and out. It only takes a few seconds, but it's sort of like wrenching it a little bit backwards and forwards. But again, it needs to be tight in order to make it stable. So I don't know if I'm gonna bother trying to fix that. It's just something I will have to live with during its operation. Okay, let's run a test. I've got my fence set up nicely here. Let's take off the safety. So you can see there that clicks off quite easily and we'll get a piece to run through. Well, there we go. This is one of the recycled bits of the veranda job that I did the other week. Now, I'm gonna to have to work on my technique. I did have a bit of snipe there that sort of comes off the end. But this uh, Maranti, I believe this is, on a half millimeter pass, went through like butter. And my process here is to actually just remove all this bloody paint so I can turn these boards into something else. And that was pretty fantastic. It is gonna create a lot of dust. I may hook up some extraction at the back here eventually, but otherwise I'm going to call this project done. Really happy with how it came out. Wish I'd had this when I did my Tassie Oak path tag holder. I'll be really interested to test this out as an actual jointer and see how well I can get some boards to glue together. But for now, I'm going to move on with the Oz Geo Master projects and clean up all of these. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.